All right, today we're going to be talking about chapter 15, the adaptive immune system. There's two things we need to consider here. There's innate versus adaptive immune systems or immune responses. An innate immune response is nonspecific. So a fever is a fever, whether it's triggered by a cold virus or by Ebola, right? It's always ready and it's fast acting. You're born with these innate immune systems. We also have adaptive immune systems, and these are specific immune responses to an antigen or a pathogen. If you have a cold virus, antibodies are produced specifically for that virus. The adaptive immune response is slower, and you're not born with an adaptive immune system. Um, antibodies can be transferred through breast milk, however. All right, there are five attributes of the adaptive immune system that you need to be aware of. There's specificity, and this is an adaptive response acts only against one particular molecule shape or antigen and not others. Second is inducibility. Cells of adaptive immunity are activated in response to the presence of a specific antigen. Third, clonality. Once induced cells proliferate to form many generations of identical cells. Four, unresponsive to self. Adaptive immune cells don't act on normal body cells, only on that one specific antigen. And five, memory. Adaptive cells form memory, which accounts for a fast secondary response. So if you ever encounter that same antigen again down the road, your adaptive immune system will remember how to take care of that foe, basically. All right, so where does the adaptive immune response take place? Well, the tissues and organs of the lymphatic system. They act as a surveillance system that screens the tissues of the body for foreign antigens. It's composed of lymphatic vessels and lymphatic cells, tissues, and organs. Think like lymph nodes in your neck. Um, and you have lymph nodes scattered throughout your body as well as you can see in the diagram. All right, antigens. An antigen is a substance that causes the body to stimulate an adaptive immune response include various bacterial these include various bacterial components as well as proteins of viruses fungi and protozoans food and dust can also contain antigenic particles all right let's talk about three different types of antigens here we have exogenous antigens these are extracellular they may be toxins and other secretions, components of the cell walls or membranes or flagella, but something outside of the pathogen itself that is acute to your immune system, that it's a foreign invader. Endogenous or intracellular, these antigens are not accessible to immune cells. Immune cells will respond if the endogenous antigen is not incorporated into cell bodies cytoplasmic membranes, so if there's some kind of external display. And then lastly, autoantigens. These are self-antigens, and they're derived from normal cell processes. So these autoantigens sort of flag normal, healthy, uninfected cells. All right, antigen-presenting cells display antigen fragments on their surface with a major histocompatibility complex. These include macrophages, dendritic cells, which are like scouts, they're very important. You find dendritic cells under the surface of skin and mucous membranes. And after, in, after acquiring an antigen, these dendritic cells migrate to the lymph nodes to interact with B and T cells. All right, and B cells are also antigen-presenting cells. Now here's a picture of a dendritic cell. It looks a lot like I picture a nerve cell with all those dendrites, all those little tree-shaped arms coming off of it. So it has a really maximized surface area. 
All right, let's talk more about MHC or the major histocompatibility complex. MHC proteins hold and position antigens for presentation. And there are two classes of MHC proteins. MHC class 1 are found on every nucleated cell except red blood cells. Red blood cells in humans don't have a nucleus. That's not true all over the animal kingdom, but in humans it is. MHC class 2 proteins are found only on B cells and antigen presenting cells. These are things like macrophages and dendritic cells. Now, an interesting sidebar uh, that might be interesting, I think it's fascinating, is the major histocompatibility complex is actually involved in mate selection. So uh, a study was done, and what it boils down to is humans actually find mates more attractive if they have MHC alleles that are different than their own. So we're attracted to people who would give our babies the most diverse and strongest MHC complexes, which is pretty slick. All right, so let's look at a model here of the MHC. We have antigens that bind to MHC molecules. So here we've got our, our cell membrane with the phospholipid bilayer. This dark blue here on the left, these are the class 1 MHC proteins. And they, these class 1 MHCs are present on every nucleated cell. So basically, most cells in your body, except for red blood cells, should have these class 1 MHCs. And they've got these antigen binding grooves, this special receptor site on the... Um, like extracellular side. So this up here on top is the outside of the cell and this shaded area at the bottom would be the inside of the cell. Okay. We also have class two MHC on B cells or other antigen presenting cells. So things like dendrites, dendritic cells you'd find here. All right. And another antigen binding groove at the top. One way to remember these is class 1 MHCs has one part of the protein that goes through the membrane. Class 2 has two parts of the protein that goes through the membrane. MHC 1 and 2. All right, let's talk now about some adaptive immune cells. I mentioned B cells. Now, these are cells that interact with extracellular antigens or exogenous antigens, things that are outside the cell, maybe on the surface or somewhere in the environment around the cell. Their major function is to differentiate into plasma cells for the eventual secretion of antibodies and the development of memory B cells which is involved in a secondary response towards the same antigen. So if years down the road you encounter the same pathogen or antigen again, your body will know how to respond appropriately. B cells have immunoglobulins on the surface of the cell. They're called B cell receptors or BCRs. And each B lymphocyte has multiple copies of the same B cell receptor. Each B cell generates a single BCR. There can be about 500,000 identical copies of the BCR within each cell. And billions of different B cells, each with a unique BCR in a human. All right, so let's look at a model of a B cell receptor here. here we've got our cell membrane of a B lymphocyte cell, cytoplasm down here, extracellular environment up above. This purple thing with the cone on it, this is the antigen. And this antigen is going to interact with these antigen binding sites on the B lymphocyte. All right. And then this is the B cell receptor or the, the red parts right here. All right, antibodies are globular proteins called immunoglobulins. They're secreted by plasma cells, and antibodies interact by binding to antigens, right? And we see this familiar Y shape we saw in previous lecture. We've got the fab arm at the top, 
and this FC stem here at the bottom. Remember the FC stem here, this part is like the flag that lets, um, targets the antigen for phagocytosis. So if we notice here's a bacterial cell, here's an antibody A that's bound to a binding site on the antigen, and that FC arm up here is flagging this bacterial cell for phagocytosis by the immune system. Down here we see a second antibody B, so it recognizes a different part of the antigen. But same thing, also flagging this cell as an invader that needs to be dealt with by the immune system. There are several different classes of antibodies, and you should be familiar with each of them. Immunoglobulin class M antibodies are the first antibodies produced. Immunoglobulin Gs are the most common. 80% of serum antibodies are immunoglobulin Gs, and they're the longest lasting antibody. Immunoglobulin A is associated with body secretions, and this is what provides nursing newborns with some protection against foreign antigens. The newborn receives antibodies against any antigens that have infected their mothers. This is one of the reasons why breastfeeding provides some really special advantages that can't be replicated with formula. All right, immunoglobulin E is involved in response to parasitic infections and also allergies. And immunoglobulin D, this is an immunoglobulin where scientists are still actively researching. We're not 100% sure what the function of immunoglobulin D is. Maybe that's a question some of you will answer if you become research scientists. Outcomes of antigen and antibody bonding. So there are these five different processes or things that happen when an antigen and an antibody bind. Agglutinization, opsonization, activation of complement, antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, and neutralization. So let's talk about what each of these terms mean. And you should be familiar with what these terms are and, and what, the, what the outcome is that they represent. So agglutination reduces the number of infectious units to be dealt with. So if you see here, initially there were five bacteria, but because of the antibodies, they've been clumped into two groups, right? Two groups are easier to deal with than five. So they help shrink the number of infectious units to deal with. Opsonization is coating antigen with antibody, and this helps to enhance phagocytosis. So we see here's the antigen. It is completely surrounded by antibodies, and that makes it easier for the phagocyte to identify and engulf. All right, activation of complement. So this is something that causes inflammation and cell lysis. So we have a, a bacterium here. The antigens have been bound by antibodies, and they also bring in a complement. And this complement helps to break apart, like it's burning a hole through the bacterial cell, causing it to lyse. Next, we'll talk about antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. It's a mouthful, but have a look at the diagram here. It's not so overwhelming as it sounds. Antibodies attach to the target cell, right? So here's antibodies, the green antibody down here attaches to the target cell. And this is something where the target cells are probably something large, like a parasite. And they cause destruction by macrophages, eosinophils, and NK cells. So these different things all work together to break through the target cell and destroy it. Perforin and lytic enzymes help to break down that cell membrane and destroy the contents. All right, and lastly, neutralization. 
This blocks the attachment areas of bacteria and viruses before they can infect host cells. So here's a virus completely surrounded by antigen and a bacterium completely surrounded by antigen. Neither of these pathogens have any antigen free to bind with host cells. Now they block, it can also block attachment of toxins. So it's not limited to the pathogen itself, but neutralization can also benefit if a toxin's present. All right, T cells have T cell receptors on their cytoplasmic membranes. And these TCRs don't recognize antigens directly. That's important to know. TCRs only bind antigen associated with an MHC protein. And they have either CD4 or CD8 proteins on their TCRs. We have T helper lymphocytes. These cells regulate the activities of B cells and cytotoxic T cells. T helper cells require antigen presentation on MHC2 and a CD4 protein. And why is this CD4 protein so important? Well, it acts as a, um, like a flag uh, so that T helper cells can recognize MHC class two proteins. T helpers become activated when antigen is presented on an MHC2 and matches its own TCR. So there's some contingencies here, but that helps the immune response to be very specific. Cytotoxic T lymphocytes have TCRs and CD8, which recognize endogenous antigen packaged with MHC class 1 protein on virally or intracellularly bacteria-infected cells. It has to be activated. And these cytotoxic T lymphocytes produce perforins, which perforate cell membranes of the pathogen, and also granzyme. These things directly kill infected cells. T cells require antigen-presenting cells with MHC class 1. Make sure you know cytotoxic T lymphocytes work with MHC. They require antigen presenting cells with MHC class 1, whereas T helper lymphocytes require antigen presentation on MHC class 2. All right, there are two major types of adaptive immune responses. The first are humoral immune responses. And these are extracellular. They have antibody immunity, and there's T-dependent and T-independent humoral immune responses. We also have cell-mediated immune responses. And these are for intracellular pathogens, things like viruses replicating inside a cell. No antibodies are involved because it's happening inside the cell. All right, applications of the immune system. So let's look at this. The graph on top here, we have on the x-axis time measured in days. And on the y-axis is the antibody concentration in blood serum. <clears throat> this is the primary response. So the first time that a tetanus toxoid vaccine is introduced to an individual. So when someone gets their first tetanus shot, their antibody concentrations look something like this. There's a lag period of three days before the body begins to produce these immunoglobulins, M, and then 15 days, really, until immunoglobulin G peaks. So there's a long period here where if you were exposed to the pathogen instead of just the vaccine, you would be sick for quite a while before your body gathered up enough of an immune response to fight off that pathogen, right? All right. And then you know that most of the time when you get shots, you also have to get a second shot, right? A booster. Usually not too long after you get your primary shot. And that's the same thing we have down here, a secondary response. So when a person gets their second tetanus toxin vaccination, we see a much larger immune response happening. So these two immunoglobulins are produced much faster and the peaks are higher. 
which is great because tetanus is no fun at all. And if I get exposed to tetanus, I want my immune system to be able to deal with that so fast. I never even feel sick. All right. You should know about primary and secondary immune responses. You should understand lag periods and be able to describe how these curves shift with secondary response. All right, let's talk a little bit more about vaccine and immunization procedures. So herd immunity is a phenomenon that occurs when a large portion of a population is immune or vaccinated against a disease. And the inability of the disease to spread due to a lack of susceptible hosts. And it's responsible for the dramatic decline in childhood disease. Childhood disease. So we've done a very good job vaccinating for things like polio, right? I don't know of a single living human who's ever had polio. Um, maybe you do, but polio is something we all know about, but I think very few of us actually know anyone directly firsthand who's ever been sick and had it, right? Um, and that's a great thing. Uh, so for like newborn babies who can't be vaccinated right away, um, or someone who's had uh, like bone marrow cancer and has lost all of their immunity that they'd gathered through vaccinations in their life prior to, to treatment, um, those people are susceptible to polio. But we can protect them by herd immunity if the rest of us are vaccinated and polio is not circulating in our population, right? So herd immunity is... Uh, a gift that we can give to others um, who can't be vaccinated, but it's not something I would want to depend on either, right? Okay, so let's look at this. The top graph here, we're looking at polio. The x-axis for both graphs is time measured in years from 1950 to 2000. On the y-axis, we have the number of reported cases in thousands. So polio was somewhere between 30 to 40,000 cases a year in the U.S. before the introduction of the first vaccine. And with the introduction of the first polio vaccine, we were able to drop the number of polio cases down to about 5,000 a year, which is incredible. And then with the introduction of a second polio vaccine in the mid-60s, Polio cases are near zero, right? And even actually towards the end of 2000, they're tapering even lower. So polio is very rare now, but it used to be fairly common. Oops. All right. And look down here. We have the same type of graph, but for measles. So measles was hovering around, let's say, 500,000 cases a year before the introduction of the first vaccine in the mid 60s. And then that brought cases down uh, to, gosh, probably 50,000 a year in the 70s and even lower. You'll notice now though that there's a spike coming up. I wish the graph went up to current day. Measles is starting to make a little bit of a comeback because most new parents have never encountered measles, right? Like people born in the 90s probably don't know anyone who's ever had the measles. Um, and they've probably never seen it. So when it comes to vaccinating their children, a lot of people wonder why nobody gets measles anymore. But it's still out there. And it does infect people who are unvaccinated, unfortunately. We've had some local like outbreaks in the Midwest in recent years. All right, immunization. So there are a few different types of vaccines. The um, strongest type are attenuated live vaccines. These vaccines use pathogens with reduced virulence. They can result in mild infection, um, but they have active microbes and these stimulate a strong immune response. They can also provide contact immunity. So you might be able to pass this attenuated 
um, pathogen off to other people around you. And it's basically like they've been vaccinated themselves. But these modified microbes may retain enough residual virulence to cause disease. So people who are pregnant or who are severely immunocompromised are not necessarily a good fit for attenuated vaccine. The next vaccine, vaccine type are inactivated or killed vaccines. These are whole agent vaccines. They have deactivated whole microbes. So like totally killed all dead microbes in the vaccine. Um, sometimes there's also subunit vaccines where they might be fragments of microbes. So if we blend up the microbes so they're all dead and we have their bits and pieces, but they're not capable of causing disease. Both are safer than live vaccines. They can't cause disease. Um, and due to a lack of replication, microbes and fragments don't provide as many antigenic molecules to stimulate an immune response. So booster shots are often needed. And third, the third type of vaccine are toxoid vaccines like the tetanus one I mentioned in our graph. These are chemically or thermally modified toxins used to stimulate immunity. They're useful for some bacterial diseases like tetanus and diphtheria, and they stimulated an antibody-mediated immunity. They require multiple doses, though, because they possess fewer antigenic determinants. This is probably why you, Tdap seems to be the most common booster shot we get as adults, right? Tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. All right, we do also have vaccines against anthrax, cholera, plague, and tuberculosis. They're available in the U.S., but limited to special populations, like the military or laboratory personnel who might be working with these organisms. These are not things that the average person is likely to ever encounter, unless you're in one of these high-risk groups. All right, so let's talk more about immunization, active immunization and vaccine safety. Some problems associated with immunization are mild toxicity is probably the most common side effect, fever and pain at the injection site. There is a risk of anaphylactic shock, an allergic reaction, and usually this is due to the, the other components that stabilize the vaccine things like egg proteins or preservatives in the vaccine itself. You may also have residual virulence from attenuated viruses that occasionally cause disease. Um, for example, in the late 90s, oral poliovirus vaccine was given, and that caused clinical polio in about one out of every two million people who were vaccinated. Fortunately, now an inactivated polio vaccine is used. So this new polio vaccine that's been given since about the 2000s, this one can't make people sick. That's a win. All right, allegations that certain vaccines cause autism, diabetes, and asthma. Um, I remember when these headlines came out, uh, and they were really unsettling. Um, but unfortunately, bad news makes popular news. And the good news that many researchers and labs all across the world have tested and tried to find links between vaccines and autism, diabetes, and asthma, and we have not been able to substantiate any of these claims. There is no link between vaccines and autism, diabetes, and asthma. Um, but of course, that headline hasn't gotten as much play. All right, so now you know some things about your um, immune system, vaccination, and immunization. Please come prepared with questions to lab or office hours, and I'll see you guys next time.